Welcome back to Basic Concepts of Nursing. We're going to continue on talking about the preoperative period. And um, we need to take a look at some anxiety interventions because fear and anxiety uh, seem to be our patient's greatest concerns. And we need to figure out a plan for this. So while you're sitting there listening, also be thinking, what is your plan? What do you want your goal to be? If you could sum up one statement as far as a goal for anxiety, what would that statement be? So jot something down, think about that, and we're going to talk about some nursing diagnosis uh, when we get together in class. So for anxiety interventions, we need to consider preoperative teaching. We know that with preoperative teaching, we have to go back to that step of the nursing process so that it goes back to that assessment assess your patient's knowledge about surgical experiences do they have prior experiences was it a good experience if they did or was it bad what do they know about surgical experiences um, and then once you know that uh, you can determine if they have a knowledge deficit which would be a diagnosis and then you need to provide them factual information so that they have a real understanding of what's going to happen however be very careful not to provide information that will cause increased anxiety uh, um, allow them time to ask questions and then respond to them as appropriately as you can but then remember if it's questions you don't feel comfortable answering or it's questions that might be on your scope, you need to refer them to the surgeon. An informed, educated patient will be able to anticipate um, events which will in turn lead them to um, maintain their self-control and you won't have that patient that's crying or screaming or trying to get away, those kinds of things. Uh, so education very important encouraging communication encourage rest you know that seems kind of funny but we want to promote rest because you and I both know that the more tired a person is the much much more easily they're going to be stressed and anxious um, so getting some sleep will definitely help reduce stress and anxiety um, and typically you know when you think about that night before surgery oftentimes patients don't sleep so maybe just a little sedative hypnotic prior you know prior to surgery um, some Ambien or a little volume, something to help them rest that night would be a really uh, nice idea, Pharma pharmacologically speaking. Non-farm, what can you do, you know, um, what can they do? A nice warm shower, uh, reading a book, back rubs, foot rubs, um, anything like that would be, you know, a benefit to help them rest. Simple uh, distraction techniques, um, so distraction uh, can be a good way to relieve anxiety. So um, listening to relaxing music, reading a relaxing book, watching something on TV, um, talking with family, anything to try to help reduce that anxiety. And then look at the family members. What do the family members know? Um, if you look at my family, I'm the only nurse out of, of six children. Um, and when any of my family has a medical concern or medical issue, they call me. And I try to be as factual as I can, but um, then when family's in the hospital, that's when they look toward me as well. And sometimes when we know too much or maybe don't know enough but just know a little, that can be kind of dangerous too. Um, but So we need to encourage communication and teaching to our family as well. Um, involve the patient's family, involve them in their care, see if they have any questions. If the family has questions, let's try to reinforce what our surgeon has taught them, reinforce what other people have taught them, and try to help alleviate anxiety. Um, on the other side of that, don't let the family dominate the conversation, especially if you have a family member that's, say, in the medical field. We tend to maybe talk above our family members. Um, so don't let those persons that might try to dominate the conversation you need to remember that you need to maintain control of that environment and just provide encouragement and then step in when necessary 
Um, it's good to have the family members stay with the patient, especially if we're talking kids. Um, the adolescent is probably not going to want family to stay there, but when you're looking at younger children, um, it's a good time. And then explain what will be expected uh, before, during, and after surgery. So let them know where they're going to be, where their loved one will be, how long they will be in surgery, when they'll come into the PACU or patient analgesia recovery unit. Um, and then if th something changes, let them know that because they're sitting out there waiting and knowing that their loved one is undergoing surgery and um, there's always surgical waiting areas for the family to wait so if something changes let them know so they're not sitting there thinking oh something must have gone devastatingly wrong it was bad you know so keep them abreast of what's going on as well preoperative drugs that we can use to decrease anxiety, you know, think of some of the anti-anxiety medications. What's going to be good? What are we going to use for our patients? Um, so think about that. Pull out your drug books, use your Nursing Central. Um, come up with a list of meds that we can talk about in class so that uh, we reinforce some pharmacology um, that you took last semester. As far as uh, children go, um, the drug of choice used for them is going to be Versed. Um, midazolam. The idea behind Versed is that it has a short duration, has a very predictable onset, and we don't see a lot of respiratory depression with it. And so it's really a very good drug of choice for kids uh, to help reduce anxiety. It can be given IV, it can be given orally, so it can be given atraumatically so that we don't have to necessarily stick the patient to give them this medication. You will also see syrups used for younger kids that maybe can't swallow pills. And I know that they use a liquid called Mayo's. It's M-A-H-O-S. Um, and that's abbreviated, abbreviated for meperidine, which is also the same as Demerol, atropine, um, hydroxazine, which is the same thing as Visteril, and then the O is Undansterone, or the same thing as Zofran, and then the S is Simple Sugar, so that uh, equivalence of Mayo's, and oftentimes they'll use uh, pre-op Mayo's in uh, kids having tonsillectomies or some type of pain-provoking uh, surgical procedure. And with the combination of those medications, they re work really nicely to help decrease some of that anxiety. Other medications that we might consider, um, we need to consider med medications used that will prevent laryngeal, uh, laryngeal spasms. And the laryngeal spasm is typically going to occur when the patient is intubated and they take that um, endotrache endotracheal tube out, then the larynx will sometimes spasm. So sometimes they will give them Valium um, to prevent that or if a patient would have a laryngeal spasm, that is a medical emergency and you do need to notify your anesthesiologist or nurse anesthetist and physician so that you have plenty of help available because when that spasms, uh, the patients lose their airway and the only way to get it to return is to get that spasming stopped. Um, medications to reduce um, vagal-induced bradycardia. When we are talking about epidurals and interthecals and spinal anesthetics, Oftentimes our patients have to be bolused with um, a liter of IV fluids to prevent a rebound or a vagal uh, bradycardia. So if we don't have the opportunity to do that, sometimes they will give epi in the, um, in the tissues or they can use um, ephedrine and um, get the If your patient would experience symptomatic bradycardia, also, a drug of choice besides epinephrine is going to be atropine, and those can both be given IV, so our patient can have almost immediate relief. Medications used to inhibit gastric secretion. The one that you will see when you go to Women's Health and you look at the patients having C-sections is uh, sodium bicitrate. It comes in a liquid. It's about 30 mil, and the patient just drinks that prior to going to surgery. Smells like grapes. It smells really good, but let me tell you from past experience, it does not taste very good. Other things, uh, Reglan, Zofran, they always prevent nausea, vomiting, but uh, Reglan also 
increases gastric emptying time, so Reglan will be used maybe for some of those patients that haven't had the opportunity to be NPO, so it's an emergency type situation and they haven't been NPO. So some nurse anesthetists and anesthesiologists will use Reglan to increase the gastric emptying. Other things, Zantac, Zantac can be given IV, Prevacid, Prilosec, any of your uh, beta-2 agonists are going to be really good to help decrease those gastric secretions. Um, and then decreasing the amount of anesthetic needed for induction and maintenance of surgery. By utilizing some of the medications that help prevent anxiety and decrease our patients' fears will in fact decrease the amount of anesthetics that, that is necessary for them. So sometimes it is good to use preoperative medications and we'll discuss those on the next slide. So those drugs for preoperatives, sedatives, hypnotics, anoxalics, opioid analgesics, anticholinergics, the H2 histamine blockers, all of these medications could be utilized in the preoperative setting. So take a minute and look up what some sedatives might be. What are those hypnotics that we're talking about so that when we start discussing the pharmacology, you will be able to recall these medications and we will be able to have a nice discussion about them when we meet in class because the idea of using the voiceover is to bring this information back to the classroom and you guys be able to apply that knowledge so when you talk about opioid analgesics opioids meaning opioid derivative um, those are going to be things that our patients are going to like this is just a couple of medications, Vistrol and Ativan. You will be seeing these used, and as I talked about with the Mayos that we give to kids, Vistrol is also a component, and it helps our patients become relaxed, become sleepy. Um, with the use of Ativan, again, same scenario can be given IV push, whereas uh, Vistrol is typically IM or PO. Uh, they both produce nice calming effects. When using Ativan, um, we have to watch for severe drowsiness, um, so much that our patient may stop breathing, things like that. And then with the Visterol, typically it does cause a dry mouth um, and will cause some dizziness. So those types of things are things that we need to be looking for. So again, that takes us back to patient safety. How are we going to keep our patients safe? And then lastly, your dosage calculations. I will have several dosage calculations that we will work through in class because math is really a huge part of nursing. And if you don't know your math, you're not going to do well. You know that a half of a milligram could be life or death for a child. 0.25 mils can mean a difference between life and death in an infant. So you have to be able to prove to us that you do know so safe dosage calculations, that you know that your calculations are correct. Yes, there's always going to be time that you can double check with another RN, um, but you need to know if your dosage is out of the normal range, you better be calling. Drugs that you have to double check, you have to double check heparin, you have to double check insulin, chemo drugs. So you have to be able to correct and um, compare your answers with other nurses. So you need to be very proficient in your medication calculations. So we will take some time in class to continue to discuss dosage calculations because dosage calculations are threaded throughout all of the exams that you will take in the rest of the nursing program. So it's very important that you become proficient with your math.